Yeah, okay. Allows me a little bit of no. little bit of movement. New technology. I don't like. I don't really like to stand still. Uh, but I like reviewing Grant Pope. I have reviewed a great man, and some of you have reviewed some have reviewed them with us. Uh, others have not. Hopefully, you'll be joining us this week. <coughs> I currently have seventy grant proposals in need of review. The authors wrote them, submitted them to various funders, or haven't submitted them yet, uh, and. They would like to have them reviewed by a bunch of experts, which will include some of you and hundreds of other folks that have signed up on our committee. We have almost 400 volunteers confirmed this round to review the 70 grant proposals that we have today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, my background, the organization I founded, some of the work that we've done. This is previous iteration of a similar haircut. <laughs> This is actually a very long time ago. I don't, some folks don't know that I don't age. This, it may surprise you to know that this picture is over 10 years old. <laughs> I have, and I have new teeth. <laughs> kind of hard to keep that one as I show this picture. Uh, but I have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for various nonprofits, including some of the nonprofits here in the hub. Uh, I used to work at Atlas Corp. I don't think any of them are here today, but they work in a, in a quarter over there. Uh, and while at Atlas Corp, I placed fellows at a bunch of other organizations that are here in the hub. And we reviewed several of the proposals from organizations, including from some folks in the room. Well, I think we reviewed a proposal, one of yours, several years ago. Yep. <laughs> Welcome. Nice to see you again. Uh, in addition to raising money, I, I've been asked to review proposals for various different grant makers. Uh, I used to be involved in a giving circle called the Slingshot Fund. Uh, we give away a few million dollars over the course of a few years. Uh, I've been a reviewer for various programs at the MacArthur Foundation, which you may remember from the end of Sesame Street. Similar programs. Uh, one of the cool things I got to do is I was a reviewer for their 100 and Change program for two years. Uh, they call those reviewers wise heads. I'm a wise head. Um, those were grants folks had asked, folks had requested $100 million for various programs. So these were pretty large NGOs. One of the proposals I read had actually been submitted by Mexico. Uh, $100 million, a lot of money for Mexico. They wanted to build a national arboretum, as I recall. I reviewed it very favorably, but it, Actually, they did not get that. Uh, also, uh, Roddenberry Foundation, Roddenberry, uh, it's the it's Star Trek one. Uh, and in fact, we had a small partnership with them. So many unfunded list reviewers have, have read there as well. I'm the host of the Open Door Philanthropy Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I did an interview yesterday, which will be coming out soon. Emily Rasmussen is the CEO of Grapevine, which is the world's largest uh, online directory of giving circles. Uh, Forward to that. Uh, and I founded on Funded List in 2015. I was a hub member for a few years, 2017 and 2018. I think we were here. Yeah. Uh, and in that time, I have coordinated a review of over 1,000 grant proposals. 1,051 to be specific. And again, we have 70 more, so that will bring us up to anybody? 1,121. <laughs> I'll be saying over 1,000 the next few years. <laughs> so, a very long time ago, when I was a baby philanthropist, I attended a declination training. Anyone heard the word declination? Pretty much only philanthropists that use the word declination. They're saying they, they define grants. Right? <laughs> and in fact, there are people who do this professionally. Uh, one of the things I'm a big fan of in philanthropy is grant makers hiring professionals to do professional work, giving away someone else's money right? by reading proposals and that sort of thing. Um, this gentleman here is Dr. Jeffrey Solomon. He wrote a book called The Art of Giving, which you can read. It's a pretty good one. He's given away a lot of money, more than I have. He was the head of Andrea and Charles Bronfman Philanthropies, uh, which completed a spend down a few years ago. And which means a spend down is when the foundation decides to give away all of their money, not just 5% a year and maintain the endowment. They're saying, let's get rid of all of this money. Uh, and over, they, they, they um, read a lot of proposals there and had it turned down a lot of so when I was first doing the Slingshot Fund giving cycle, which was incubated at ACBP, they brought in Dr. Jeffrey Solomon to give us a training on how to say no. It was a very helpful training, and I generally agree with everything he had to say in there. But as a fundraiser, some of what he had to say was frustrating. Here's how he explains uh, how best to decline a grant. Right? You want to deliver to the grantee a ball a shiny, silver, smooth ball with no cracks or handles or anything. And it 
It should be maybe a little greasy and slippery. So that when you hand, and, and preferably you're standing on sand when you do it. <laughs> so you hand the ball to them and they drop immediately. They try to, they try to pick it up in the sand. And the like, camera follow me now? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and they won't be able to pick the ball up to give it back to you. Right? You want to deliver that ball to them and go focus on the grantees that you've chosen to fund. And there's a lot of reason to think that the professional philanthropists should spend most of their time focused on, on the proposals that they have a role. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Solomon, and I, this is best practice at a lot of foundations, right? The rejection process should not have any information. If you say, we well, you rejected your grant proposal because it was not sustainable. They'll say, but it is sustainable. And here's my nine points about why it is. But they did, that was, they, they had their chance to make that point and that chance is over now. These decisions have been made. This, when you're in this sort of declination conversations, like there, there is no unringing the bell, right? The committee met, the committee has all gone back to their homes, like this is it. Especially if it's a family foundation, something like that, where the decision makers might not be professional, right? Uh, and also there's just sort of a lot of power dynamics. If you, want, you don't want to tell that organization you're not sustainable and have them be like, all right, we need to become sustainable now because they told us to, right? You generally want to assume the folks running the organization is their best. Nobody gets every grant. I don't never met such a person. I've been rejected many, many times, uh, including by folks that later asked me to come and review proposals with them. <laughs> uh, Dr. Solomon's not the only person out there talking about declining. Uh, this is a quote from a guy I've met a few times. His name's Stephen Green. And he's in charge of declinations. He has, his title is not declination director or anything, uh, but he does all the declining at a place called the Jim Joseph Foundation, uh, which is a large, which is a large Jewish foundation. They actually don't even accept proposals, uh, but they have, they're very big and they have a lot of people in their network and there are a lot of like, no conversations, yes, no. Uh, and there's an article here, uh, you can see that I put it here, it's from Candid that I found. Uh, and, and you'll see, this is the most like, of all the tips, for how to decline grants that I was able to find when I was researching this. This is this is the tip that had the most meat to it. Most people generally agree with Dr. Solomon. It's just sort of wasted effort to try to give actual feedback. If you are the fund, I'm gonna get in. I, I don't think that we, we don't have to, like I think there's ways for proposal reviewers to get feedback. That's why I found it on funded list so that we can provide independent feedback. As a funder though, Dr. Solomon believes too difficult, right? Make, make clear to them they're not getting the grant so they can move on to other things. Um, generally, I agree here with some of the stuff Stephen Green's saying, but it's pretty cursory. I'm sure some of you have gotten rejection letters that follow this advice, uh, right? So one, he's, so he's saying that the foundation can, in fact, turn a moment of declination into positive outcomes for the grant seeker by being transparent about funding priorities, uh, delivering the message with clarity and with sensitivity, and by assisting as appropriate in other ways. So one, helping the organization better understand the strategic priorities of the funder and leaving open the possibility for future funder organizational alignments. Right? This, so if Stephen was declining someone and he thought there might be a future possibility of that foundation, he might meet with them and talk about that foundation and make them feel better about that so they can understand what the next step is. Right? Uh, and also identifying other potential funders that are a better fit for the organization. I'm not sure I, that funders can do this, I've never seen a funder that does it particularly well. I think it'd be great if funders were suggesting other places to apply or doing introductions like that. I've personally not ever encountered a funder who was doing that. Usually I get rejection letters that say like, to find funders, check out foundation directory, right? Something like that, which is a good idea. You should be doing research to find them. Uh, but I, I, in my experience, the professionals who work at foundations don't actually talk to professionals who work at other foundations very often. They're not really like looking for deal flow in that way. And it's just sort of not really a sort of communication that's happening. But maybe funders will get better at it someday. Uh, one of them wrote a blog about it, <laughs> which is a pretty good sign. I'll say many decades ago, they they wouldn't have been talking as much about the process of the client. And, and still, there are foundations that do not, <coughs> the, the folks who got the grants get, get told that they won. And everybody else finds out because too much time has passed <laughs> and they're obviously not going to get that grant, right? So what can we do about it? Right? The actual thorough review of grant proposals is very valuable. 
here's some pictures of some of our evaluators. We went to the UN Civil Society event in Salt Lake City, Utah, several years ago. We took some pictures of folks. And actually, we asked them what was their favorite SDG, and we changed the light filters to be the same color as that SDG, so you can tell what issues <laughs> these folks care about based on what color their faces. Occasionally, that color would not be very good for that particular skin tone, and so we would tell them they needed to care about a different color. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I Violet, I think is her name. Okay, the green one is the STD. Hardly anybody looks good in a green tip. She looks fantastic. <laughs> All right, so um, I. Oh, yes. So, yes, uh, Stephen went on. I forgot about this one. I included this in there. Stephen went on to. He had more tips for the person being rejected. Much more to say to them, right? And in general, it's so this first one is right. Expending less of the organization's fiscal it means don't waste your time, right? Basically, fund or fit. You were not a fit for this program. I'm sure as a professional definer, that's probably the number one reason, number one thing he sees in his in his in what he's doing, right? Reassessing the proposed grant to learn what about it could be more compelling or perhaps adapted. To align with a specific potential funder. Hmm. Well, <laughs> that's going to be difficult to do if you're not getting any feedback from the original fund, right? You're going to need some sort of perspective react reaction to this, right? When I was writing grant proposals, if I got rejected or even before I submitted things, I would try to show my drafts to as many people willing to read it, give me feedback as, as possible. Uh, the very first evaluator front finals was my mother, who has been reading everything I wrote since I learned how to write. Uh, and so I'm sure many of you have someone like that in your life who you've been willing to read the things that you write. That's really like it, it's very hard to figure out how something you wrote could be more compelling. Probably you thought it was pretty compelling when you wrote it. Right? Uh, further targeting the list of potential funders based on funding priorities, right? And reducing staff time, and he's saying don't waste your time applying. Three is the same as one, right? Uh, asking for outside advice on how to improve the organizational model to find avenues of future funding. So that, 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 again, right, outside advice, independent perspective on your grant proposal. People, not people who are going to reject or, or uh, decline your grant, and not people who work at your organization and are in the weeds on it, people who can give you an outside perspective on it. So this is how a funding list can be very, very helpful. Uh, we have 70 proposals to review. Some of them have been declined by places. I have uh, written out a little list of some of the places that have declined these proposals. Uh, first of all, I'll list some of the countries that they are from. I think there's a few countries I've missed. Uh, but this round, we have proposals from Argentina, Bolivia, Canada, Cambodia, Chile, Colombia, Gambia, Ghana, Ghana, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, Madagascar, Mexico, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Peru, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Sudan, Uganda, the United States, and Venezuela, as well as several refugee camps, uh, which I wasn't sure <laughs> how to qualify some of them. Um, obviously, I didn't pronounce all of those country names correctly. I, but Lesotho, I've been practicing. This is a very tiny country, here, landlocked inside South Africa. It's the first time we ever got a proposal. So uh, I was on a podcast a little while ago, uh, Lauren Steiner's Grants Plus podcast, and she asked me to come up with a list of the five mistakes that grant writers make. Right? I've read over a thousand proposals in the last seven years. I've seen them making a decent number of mistakes, but honestly, pretty much the same, same set of five mistakes, which are these ones. Number one, this is what I said in the podcast, they aren't necessarily making any mistakes. The vast majority of grant proposals get rejected. As someone who's been in the situation of having to read them and choose which ones we aren't funding, this is very difficult. I rarely see a proposal that, that I'm like, this shouldn't be funded. I, that's not something that I, I, I see problems in proposals all the time. But at the very least, this is a real problem, right? And there's the beginning, at least the beginnings of a real solution. And putting some money into it would help make things better for some folks, right? Um, and I think it's important when someone gets rejected by a grant and you're trying to help them. To make it clear that like you know just because they didn't chose you doesn't mean this was a doesn't necessarily mean that this was a flawed proposal right um beyond that uh right i think the most common thing mistake that they do make is that is like he was saying they aren't a fit for the funding there are proposals in this round 
I've already read it. I wish I could go back in time, save these, save these people some time. Because they had absolutely no, they, and in some cases, the funders were very clear. Their RFPs said, we do this. And the applicant didn't do that. Right, and there was, and 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 so that, that, that's why the I think the folks who do professional refining uh, are sympathetic to this. Whenever they have to, they, they understand how much time things take. Yes, please. And if anybody else wants to interrupt with questions, feel free. When when they're not a fit for the funder, when you review the proposal, do you provide them with um, possible funders that would be a good fit? If I can, <laughs> if you are reviewing a proposal and you're saying this is not a fit for the funder, but it would be a fit for these funders. That's this is write that down. <laughs> you should definitely write that down. That is excellent feedback, and lots of the evaluators in our committee do. And in fact, we have a special. If you want to, we have, there's a button that says if you want to introduce them to a funder, you can click that button and offer an introduction, or just suggest a resource that they can apply to. And I think one of the questions on our forum says specifically, "What other funders would this proposal be a fit for?" Uh, I agree with the professional decliners in the presentation. That's some of the best feedback you can give to a proposal. Uh, and if you evaluate with this round, you'll see as they've submitted our proposals to us, we ask at the end, we say, do you have anything else to tell us? Pretty much all of them say, we would love to know some other funders to apply to. <laughs> right? And sometimes I'm wondering, why do you tell me that? Obviously. <laughs> right? But they, they, it is, uh, it's difficult to find funders to apply to. Uh, I think there's a lot of resources now that can help with that. Uh, when I started working as a fundraiser, uh, I used, what did I, what was the first thing I used? I think foundation director. Is the first thing I got trained on. That's still around merge with Canva. But now there's lots of extra ones, grant station, instrumental, like grant advisor. There's lots of you can use ProPublica's nonprofit explorer tool to look up funders. Uh, we had a, a session a few months ago with a group called Impala. It's a very powerful and robust tool for um, doing any kind of research on the nonprofit sector. Um, but like just because you're eligible for grants and you're a fit for the RFP, this is good information. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you can even apply to it. Not everybody, not everywhere is accepting proposals. And the world's a very big place. If you go out there and say, I'm giving money away, please, anybody send me a proposal. You're probably going to get too many to read carefully, unfortunately. Um, and that's why most funders will be very restricted. Like, that's why they're often geographically restricted, just because fundamentally they would receive too many. Fundamental problem with philanthropy is you will get too many proposals, There's too many proposals. Uh, right. Uh, third, right. They did not put themselves in the shoes of the funder or the other applicants. There's a lot of talk in the nonprofit sector about empathy. You're supposed to try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see, right, what you're doing from their perspective. And I think when we're writing our grant proposals, we sometimes forget about that. Right. That proposal you sent off is going to be read by human beings, and the other people. Submitting so proposals will be written by human beings, but increasingly human beings with the help of chat GPT. And right, I think so. I, I've heard a lot of proposals where very clearly the author didn't seem to realize that other people were applying. Right? You're, this is competitive. You may not have gotten into the nonprofit sector because you wanted to like be a cutthroat competitor, but that's what's happening. If they choose somebody else, that means you don't get the grant. And the people you want to help will not be helped. Uh, so you really need to put your like, if particularly when it's trying to, to to say like, will the funder respond well to this, or like, will my proposal be better than the other proposals that they receive? Right. You need to spend some time. This is something where our process can be very helpful. I literally am wearing different shoes from you, so I will give you my perspective on your proposal, and that will help you to understand other people's perspectives. Number four. Okay. Can I have yeah, please, Marsh. Is a I think related to this is something that I'm actually seeing emerging in the, this whole conversation about funding and applications is nonprofits still struggle with their ability to clearly articulate their distinctiveness in the marketplace. I mean, yes. This was something that, you know, I ran into it's for local applications. You know, that's a question that says, please distinguish yourselves, you know, and I was reading applications. I'm going, okay, please tell me how you are different than the five other organizations that are using yes. sports to engage young people. But articulating that distinctiveness is always a, seems to be still a challenge. I think it's related to this because they, Absolutely. right, they're going to have to fit themselves into the firm of the 25 other nonprofits that are also helping youth in the city. How is I, as the reviewer, how do I? If you're the sort of that? person who's a cutthroat businessman looking to like 
destroy your competition, right? You probably didn't go work at a small nonprofit and start writing <laughs> grant proposals, right? So it's very understandable that they don't. They oftentimes they pay low balance and local. The um, that some of the proposals that we've that we've read, the RFP asked, right? How are you different? Who else does this? And how are you different? That is a question on some grant proposals, and it is a question that I've seen answered very poorly. Yeah. I remember one proposal in particular. Uh, all of the evaluators picked up on it. They didn't mention any other organizations when answering that question. And there were well-known organizations that worked on that issue. It made it seem like they had never heard of them. Mm. And when I got onto the, when I, after the process and they've been given the written feedback, I talked to them face to face. You know, and I asked, I'm like, you know, many of our evaluators were wondering why you didn't, they, they so, so, and I got an answer that's very interesting. So they, this person was from the Midwest <laughs> and has been, and it is cultural for her to not compare herself to other people. She told me that it that, that she was so uncomfortable with with the idea of having to compare herself or her. And, and, and I'm, I'm like, you're not comparing yourself. <laughs> you are comparing your organization to another organization. And boy, I hope you think that your organization does something that that organization does not. Right. And, but again, I think there, there are, and I've talked to some fundraisers from, let's say, New York or Boston, who have absolutely no qualms about mentioning other organizations and talking about how much better than them. Not for nothing, it's one of the reasons why like organizations in New York might raise more money than organizations in the loop. Um, the other, any, anybody, anybody other? No, right. Uh, so uh, speaking of questions, right, uh, I think another thing, right, as you're reading the proposal, you might be sitting there thinking like, how are you different? One question you might be thinking is, how are you different from so-and-so right across town, right? Or, or other questions. You may I, often I read a proposal and I have the same question the entire. I'm just sitting there waiting for my question to be answered as I read the proposal and never find it. And then I have to reread the proposal. Um, another way our program can be really helpful. You read a proposal. If that happens to you, tell them I had I wanted this question answered and it was never answered. That can be tough for the authors, right? They're responding to prompts, right? Uh, and um, right, the, the, I think it is true. Many organizations are. Or that they're in it for the work and to help people, not to like do PR for themselves. And it's sort of fun, they're fundamentally not like suited for that. And lastly, it's just they've made unrealistic pie in the sky requests. I'd say like 5% of all the proposals we've ever gotten were asking for like way too much money. The organization had like never had no track record of accomplishment. There was just really no reason to think that this was something realistic. Right? And I, I actually think we don't have that many in the in the batch this round, but like. If you're reading it, you said this does not seem like something that could possibly happen, right? That's this is good feedback. So here are some tips. These are we do our Q and A's for evaluators. These are the tips that we that we give. Right? Uh, do your best uh, and don't be shy. Uh, in general, I will say you know, we have we have hundreds of reviewers. Uh, about forty five percent of them are male, and about forty five percent of them are, are female. And the only ones who have ever come to me and say, right, I think this, but I'm not sure I should share it. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's right. I don't know if I have enough experience to share this. This is only the women have ever, have ever all the men assume that any thought that they have in their head is valuable and, and needs to be shared in, in very lengthy format. Uh, and in general, I think all it should both be shared, right? I think maybe some of the men could tone down a little bit. The longest comments I get by far are all from men. Um, but um, every every round, I hear from at least a dozen women, and they have something very valuable to say. They want to check with me first to make sure that that's going to be helpful. And I, without exception, it always is. It's, if you're thinking it, you should write it down. It's going to be helpful. Your perspective has value. Right? Uh, to the author, you should extend the benefit of the doubt. One of the so with our program, we are reading proposals from all over the world that were that were submitted to a variety of different funders. I will. Um, List some. And English isn't necessarily their first language. The majority of them, it is not. <laughs> the majority of the authors we are reviewing this round, English is, was not their first language. For some of them, as far as I can tell, English might be their fifth, sixth, seventh language. Um, uh, several of them have used, this is the first round that we have proposals that, that used ChatGPT to help. Uh, I'm sure some previous rounds were using some similar stuff. Uh, and, in, and in general, we review it if they, as long as they're say, explaining how they use it. We have a question that we ask them, tell us you wrote the proposal, right? And that question specifically says, what's your first language, right? How comfortable are you writing in English? That sort of thing. 
this does go to a, 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 a so one if english is not your first language you can write winning grammar proposals many people do you should understand though that you're competing you might be competing against native english speakers that's going to be difficult i myself write very good grants uh even if i like even if i don't actually know what i'm doing i i know what funders are looking for and i will be i difficult to compete with uh, when the hub had a grant contest for members, I thought it was of course. <laughs> um, and we actually did a very an event similar to this. David. Looking at your number two, maybe I've been doing this wrong for a few years because I have looked at the uh, proposals as if I was a funder and, you know, I, and I'm looking for problems as well as promise um, yes. uh, and i have not really extended the benefit of the doubt more than i think i would if i was you know going to uh, be responsible for investing money in the project yes uh so one one thing i'll say about so one of the reasons to benefit the doubt without uh, to give the benefit of the doubt with us is these proposals are in different formats so one comment we get sometimes from evaluators that's not always so helpful is like you didn't include a budget or something like that the original, <laughs> the original funder didn't ask for one. So, so like, right, and, and, and usually when you are reviewing, like when I reviewed for 100 and change, every proposal I read was in the same format, right? Because they had all applied to the same thing. Our folks have applied to a bunch of different funders. I've got, a, this is just some of them. Uh, Global Innovation Fund, UNDP, Global Fund for Children, Caritas Swiss, Open Society Foundation, which sponsored this room, uh, African Union, the European Union, the Finnish Embassy in Addis Ababa, I'm particularly well suited to review. The German embassy in Bolivia, the US embassy in Argentina, something called Foundation S, the Coca Cola Foundation, Kettering Philanthropies, Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, PEPFAR, the Zaya Sustainability Prize, uh, dozens of small family funders, uh, a couple other corporate funders, and, and, and a large number of just sort of unsubmitted proposals. So, like, and usually if, if they've applied to a specific program, they will share the RFP for that. And you can't, and so, and that can help you put yourself in the shoes of the funder and try to share that. And I think you can do both. I think you can ex both extend the benefit of the doubt and say, if I were a funder reading this proposal, here's how I would respond. And I think that will be very helpful. That will be a very helpful review with you. Um, speaking of which, be helpful and candid. I, I think there's a lack of candor in philanthropy. And so, candid is a word that I've been using. Since I founded the organization, <laughs> a couple years after I founded the organization, two of the largest nonprofits in the sector merged and changed their Started name to using Canada. That. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure why they chose that word because, I, as far as I can tell, they've actually become less canned. <laughs> um, large powerhouse in organization. If you're interested in data on philanthropy in the nonprofit sector, this is that that's the only this Guy Star and Foundation Directory merged to form Canada. What I mean about candid here is, right? So if you want to if you want to read the proposal and be like and just say positive things to them, right? Uh, bless your heart. This is wonderful. I'm so inspired by your wonderful work. I that's helpful. I like I'm a founder. I like hearing that sort of thing. In my and, and if they are new as a funder, if, I think you can. Or sorry, if they're new as a founder, it's their first few years. Those sorts of things are going to be actually important and useful. This is discouraging to begin. As someone who has run his nonprofit for eight and a half years, I can tell you, I personally don't want to hear any of that. I don't, I don't, if you, do you think this is great? This, I, I'm, I'm trying to do advanced thinking on the organization. I'm really trying to move it forward. I want, if you want to help me, I want insights. I want to hear what I'm doing wrong, right? I, 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 I want to hear some, some, some new creative suggestions. I don't need the, the pat on the back. I still get them every now and then and I do. <laughs> and I have plenty of people in my life who are supportive to me, which is very important. Find a nonprofit. One of those folks, Margaret, sitting out there. Hello. Yeah. She has she's our board chair and has been helping out for a long time. Has reviewed a large number of grant proposals. In fact, I could look it up. Oh, it's probably not as many as I <laughs> But I will. I would have to actually. It doesn't number them. I would have to count. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, lastly, uh, this is something that folks sort of ask me about. Right. Our reviews aren't anonymous. Don't have to be anonymous. It's more about your background you give. The more helpful that'll be. If you're reading a newspaper article about an important topic, there's an anonymous quote in there. 
you don't really know what to make. You're not sure why should I care what an anonymous person thinks about this, right? Um, if you if you are a funder who works at a foundation, and you start your comment with "I'm a funder who works at a foundation and I think this," they're going to read that comment. They're good. They're good. And then when they come to talk to me afterwards, they're going to ask more clarity, and that's where they're going to go in. Same, uh, another really good comment we get often is when I used to raise money for a similar cause, and we were having similar issues, and here's what we did. They, they, I can, they love that sort of stuff. Uh, and I also think evaluators like sharing those experiences. These are captive audiences who are going to be interested in hearing about them. Not everybody cares about your struggles at work. Trust me. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, yeah, do not be shy about this. You see someone doing something that's fundamentally wrong, even if it's right. And I, I say this particularly for ESL. I've talked to some um, folks who are writing proposals in other languages, and I've talked to some ESL teachers about this. And generally, everybody agrees. You should feel free to correct mistakes that they're making in English. Uh, don't be mean about it. Uh, but if they're using a the word wrong, right, they're going to need to know that. One of the things I have noticed with applicants from Latin America. A lot of confusion between founder and funder. Mm -hmm. And one of the proposals this round, in fact, only says founder, including several times where clearly they meant funder. But those are two very different words. <laughs> and um, I actually, one of our partner, uh, Clara, was doing was doing it on a call with me, and I didn't know what she meant. So I had to, I had, I was like, listen, I'm really sorry to do this, but like, and she would, I, I, she was very grateful. She just, many people weren't understanding her. Now, now she can fix it, right? So, and, and I do it with tact, but like, even if it's a basic thing like that, feel free to, th those things can be very helpful in rural relations. And, and like I said, it is not always right. Okay, real quick. With this, I'm assuming we should probably guard, yeah. we are there to review and evaluate the proposal and their attempt to seek funding for something. We should probably not get into, even though we might instinctively want to help them like redesign their program and meet, I'm assuming you could give all kinds of advice and all of a sudden, well, here, if you wanted to, I mean, I guess we have to, I mean, probably should set a line for yourself. Otherwise, you're, you're all of a sudden, you're finding yourself redesigning their, oh, if you just I mean, change I think they're unlikely to redesign their program. Yeah. Because you, I, I mean, I, yeah, I just was like, okay, well. Where but if you, if that's, I, what I, what I generally say is if you're reading the proposal and you have a thought in your head, we would like for you to write thought down. Got it. Okay. Because these, the, the author doesn't have access to those thoughts until, until you do so. Um. So let's say, so if there are people out there that, that learn about a program and think it should be redesigned, they need to know that that's a response right. that people have to hearing about their program. So then they can write it in a way that, make, that convinces people it doesn't need to be, right? Um, you can write, the, and I would say that's, that's, that's um, not, not a particularly glamorous thing. Uh, but like I said, the, a lot of talk about philanthropy and doing good and social good, right, is, um, PR fueled. Talk, most philanthropists now have a public have a PR agent, um, in addition to the professionals that help them with their grant making. I know this from my experience with the podcast, where I interview philanthropists. Every week, I get an email from two or three uh, either in wealthy individuals that want to go on a podcast, or philanthropy advisors who run a firm who want to go on a podcast. Or uh, just yesterday, I interviewed um, the CEO of Grapevine Network of giving circles, right? Because her PR agent thought it'd be good if she came on to my podcast, right? Uh, giving money away is very glamorous. People like it. You get good, the reason they're doing this is if it's good, it's really great press. Read, if you read, there are, <laughs> in fact, there's only two types of stories about philanthropists, extremely negative and extremely positive, right? And most, mostly just extremely positive, right? What we're doing here is just trying to be basic about the grant proposal work is not is not really that kind of glamorous PR related stuff. It is not the event. It's not the handing the big check to somebody, right? It's just we're, edit, we're editing papers, right? Uh, and so a lot of times people sign up thinking that they're going to be very, very inspired by the proposals they receive. And instead, it's just a lot of long stuff to read and correct. Right? That's what we're doing. We're editing documents. Just like in college, when your roommate asked you to, to read his paper and make a bunch of comments on that. We're just doing that at a, at a pretty big scale. Uh, and folks like it. We ask, uh, not all of them follow up with me after we get the report, after we send the report. Uh, and in fact, sometimes they do pivot, go try to find other funding or quit altogether. It's actually something that I find quite rewarding. It's not a very, it's not a very glamorous metric to tell the funders about, but these folks who quit, 
I just want to be clear. They weren't going to succeed. Like I'm not, this isn't just my opinion. This is the opinion of every single person who I had evaluate their proposal and ultimately their own opinion, right? Not every, like, and, and they would have probably kept going at it for maybe several more years without succeeding. And, and several of them were able to go, right, find other opportunities that are, that are working out a lot better for them, right? It's very hard to tell yourself, right, this, this isn't going to work out. I can promise you I, every single grant proposal I wrote and submitted I thought was going to get funded. And most of them didn't. Uh, so here's just a few of the testimonials. I have a testimonials document every time somebody emails me and says thank you, right? I put it on a little document. Uh, Matthew uh, from Elevate Prize was one of our first larger, this was a co review partnership like we have with Link, where Teresa works. So that's where folks share with us all of the proposals who applied. And then we independently reviewed them. The program made its decisions about who would win the Elevate Prize. And then afterwards, every single person who applied got a report from us. And it was very cool. What was neat about it is, you know, I didn't necessarily agree with who won. So I was you know, talking to some folks and, and you know, they, they would come onto the call all ready to like defend their program. Like I said, they were ready to try to pick up the silver ball and get it back to them, right? And they were surprised to find out, like, yeah, I agree. I think you were better than the group that won, but neither of us makes decisions at Elevate Prize. And so here we are, right? And I, we were able to have a productive conversation, right? About other places they could, and I believe they ended up applying for some other prizes. <coughs> uh, Bethany from Food Rescue sends us proposals pretty, very often. Uh, and also evaluate proposals with us. Something I'm very excited about here is that a very large number of folks who send us proposals end up joining the committee and also reviewing proposals. I think flint, global philanthropy all over the world can become much more inclusive and more effective if we have more trained proposal reviewers. If you have a lot, I've read thousands of proposals. I'll happy, I'll happily come and volunteer with you and, and help you read your read proposals and score them so you can make your grant making decisions. Here in DC, most of the federal grant makers need volunteer reviewers. Most, and you, and you can be pretty effective at that. Um, lots of family foundations will do this sort of thing. Contact the community foundation. Uh, so Spur Local probably still needs reviewers. Do you still, do you need reviewers? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda needs reviewers. Um, I was just saying city, well, city government. All of the city, city I volunteered city, yeah. for a couple of cycles. You can even, in, um, oftentimes, so I have recently left D.C. and I've gone back to Maine, where I now have congressional representation. <laughs> and my local congresswoman, Shelly Pingree, she has uh, a nonprofit day several times a year and talks about all the stuff that's going on. She has people from the Maine Association of Nonprofits come in, talks about federal grants that are available for folks, talks about programs that are in need of reviewers, right, and, and all, all that sort of stuff. If you find yourself living in a place with representation, <laughs> Highly recommend it. Many states have uh, a line similar to so it's sometimes it's two one one, uh, and it's the grants. Uh, it's the grants version of nine one one. It's real. It's free. When first someone first told me about it, I didn't believe it. Um, and that is it. That is unfunded list. Most of you have signed up to be evaluators. I have been doing the assigning, and hopefully by the end of this week, very possibly early next week. I will send my assignments out to all 400 of the evaluators. You'll have a month to do your reviews. Uh, we will collate that in reports. We will send it out. Uh, and uh, we will talk to them about their feedback. And what, what's neat is we're going to keep going with Kuja Link. And hopefully these folks will send us updated drafts afterwards. Right? And we can be working with these outfits for years to come. They are educating women and girls, working on climate change helping refugees, uh, work on food scarcity issues, energy, you name it. You name an SDG or a color of the spectrum and, and folks are working. Uh, so uh, thank you all for coming. This was my first time giving this particular presentation. How did I do? Good. Good job. Good job. Hey, David, yeah, thank you very much. Do you want me to say a word or two? Oh, please. About uh, yes, let's have you come up and talk a little bit about okay. this. So, Teresa, where's that? Google link. So what you're going to do, I'm going to wave and stop following me. You come up here, okay. wave. Yeah. That awesome. <laughs> yeah, we'll Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Crawford, and I live here in Washington, D.C., but I work for 
a global organization with roots in Africa that's based in Kenya called ADESO. It's African Development Solutions. It's a 30-year-old nonprofit that was founded originally to um, okay. work with. First, you have to unlock your device. <laughs> the Somali <laughs> community in Somalia um, and then in Kenya. And then over the last 30 years has become a leader in what um, people would call the decolonization movement of, of global philanthropy and of aid and development. So ADESO has, you know, over the last about 10 years since the World Humanitarian Summit, really been pushing on this idea of how do we unlock more resources from those who have the resources in America, largely um, foundations, um, as well as from bilateral and multilateral organizations like the UN or um, USAID or the British Development um, FCDO. How do we unlock more of those resources to flow to what is conservatively estimated like 10 to 12 million civil society organizations that are in countries that receive humanitarian and development assistance? So imagine those you know, 10 to 12 million organizations um, thinking about the multiple ways in which they can um, raise the resources necessary to fund their work. Some are doing it through earned revenue, partnerships with their government, some get money from foundations, some get money from international nonprofit organizations. There's many, many different ways they're raising money. And one of the least transparent and least accessible of those places to get funding has been from philanthropists for a myriad of different reasons. Um, so, some of which boil down to a lot of those foundations don't even have websites and the ones, ones that do have websites don't accept unsolicited proposals. So of course, imagine those 10 million organizations trying to figure out um, how they might get funding. Huge shift in the last 10 years amongst philanthropies thinking about how to decolonize their philanthropy. They've done a lot of work thinking about where did our wealth come from? How did we you know, earn our wealth in the first place? just dig a little bit into how Carnegie might have made their money or Ford or any of those. And you know that that was part of a system that benefited from um, colonization and benefited from sort of the global um, economic system that exists. So a lot of these foundations are thinking about the same question. How do we get more resources into the hands of what um, they use the term proximate leaders, so leaders close to the challenges, close to the problems, coming from the communities um, that are working on these issues. So whether they're refugee-led, women-led, youth and children-led, led by indigenous people, um, how do we get funding into their hands? So Adesso a couple of years ago said, we can't just complain about the problem, we need to come up with some solutions um, and, and pilot those solutions and test those solutions that'll help unlock that funding to these local and national organizations. And to give you just a little perspective on it, Ukraine, country going through a, a major conflict and, and war right now, 1% of the funding that was raised to respond to Ukraine went to local and national CSOs, 1%. It, in my mind, that's a crime when you've got people perfectly capable, you know, know the issues in their communities and instead the money is going to UN agencies, it's going to, um, you know, INGOs, many, many steps removed from the challenges that are happening in Ukraine. So what Adesso said is, what are, what's a solution we can put in place that can help address some of the issues that philanthropies and nonprofits have said stand in the way of getting those resources into the hands of these um, civil society organizations. We've uh, developed a platform and a set of services for CSOs and for philanthropies. It's called Kuja Link. Kuja Link in Swahili means like come, come, come together. And so that one of the, the barriers that existed was a very big distance between grant makers and the CSOs that they um, wanted to fund and support. So how could we shorten that distance? And so that's what the Kuja Link platform is about. We found Dave because one of the, the requests, repeated requests from CSOs was, you know, we send these proposals in to the handful of funders that do accept unsolicited or have um, open RFPs and we get zero feedback. And so we're constantly sending these proposals in and we never know 
sort of what did we do wrong? What didn't work? Where would we be better spent, you know, spending our time? And so I <laughs> gave great on LinkedIn, found him on LinkedIn, saw what unfunded listed, and I said, this would be an amazing service that we could provide to the CSOs on our platform to help kind of shorten that distance between them and funders where they could begin to better understand the the way funders are thinking they could you know talk with somebody you know who is in that those funders where's those funders shoes and give them some more um, feedback on all these multitude of proposals that they are submitting we do a bunch of other things with Kujalink. you all can go and check it out some of the things that we do is we help with this issue of alignment so that CSOs can dig deeper and gain a better understanding about um, the priorities of particular funders, the areas they fund it, who are some of the other organizations they fund. Um, we do funder briefings where we help educate funders who are interested in a particular country or topic about the local and national CSOs they could be funding. So we're going to do, I thought it was pretty evident, but we're going to do some funder briefings around Ukraine to help some of these funders increase that 1% that they're giving locally to local and national organizations in, uh, in Ukraine. So that's where a big chunk of these new proposals are coming from. These are members of the Kujalink platform. Um, they've been recruited largely through their membership in their national networks. So they might be members of the Nigerian NGO network, or they might be members of the civil society network in Bolivia or they might be members of Civicus. So these are organizations that are all fairly connected nationally within their countries. There you know, are organizations that have been around for a while. They've gotten funding from a couple of different sources, but have, have not yet kind of cracked the nut of either getting money directly from a foundation or from a regrantor or intermediary organization that funds like a global fund for children or a global fund for women. So this is, um, we've calculated that they're probably getting, and Dave will have to talk about this, five to $6,000 of pro bono support. Um, oh, how much is that? Oh, how much is it that? worth this advice that they'll be getting through on funding? A lot more than that. Yeah, okay, more. If you were to pay for it. Yeah, if they were to pay for it. It would be it, prohibitively expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these nonprofits do more not have access thousand. to you know, professional fundraisers, they don't have access to um, uh, to these kind of resources, um, either because they can't afford it, they don't have it restricted to pay for it. I would say it's some of them do. There were a couple that, that, are, have, that are from some pretty serious organizations yes. that have grant writers on staff yeah. that are just looking for feedback on that. Yeah. We get we get proposals at all stages. I would say that definitely there. I mean, you have some CSOs that we work with. We are talking 30 to $50 million a year organizations mm -hmm. in their own right, in their own countries, um, especially in countries that have gone through a big crisis. So there's some Syrian organizations that are that large. There's some Indian organizations that are that large. Um, there's some Colombian organizations that are not that large. So th these are not all necessarily small kind of underfunded organizations. They could be quite large. They just haven't gotten funding necessarily um, consistently from the um, foundations. So that kind of gives you a sense of the flavor. They were all recruited through a network of um, these community facilitators that we have that are part of, of Kujalink. So Clara is the one that we work with in um, Latin America. Halima um, covers Sub-Saharan Africa. And so They've had, we've tried to coach them and support them through this process, but this is a pilot. This is the very first time they're being invited into this um, process. And we're hoping they get some value out of it and that the reviewers find it a rewarding experience as well and learn something in the process so that we can get to the point where we're not just reviewing, you know, 70, we're reviewing hundreds. Because like I said, there's, you know, 10, at least 10 million organizations around the world that um, would uh, benefit, I think, from this. Yes. Yeah. 10 million. Uh, cool. We can scale to that. There's, it, there's definitely millions of proposals. Yes. Oh, most definitely. Most I mean, organizations definitely. tend to write more than one. For sure. For sure. We do have one proposal from Ukraine, mm -hmm. which was I, which I, I, I forgot to add to the list because the one came in late. Yeah. With several new countries added to the list, um, thanks to the partnership, which is very cool. Um, difficult for an organized grant maker to fund in a situation like Ukraine. 
beyond just the proposal. <laughs> yes. There are many, but, I, but I am excited to have I mean, this you one. look, Center for Disaster Philanthropy, Global Fund for Children, Global Fund for Women got millions of dollars out the door to Ukraine in the early days. And now bringing along with them, you know, Hilton Foundation, Cargill Foundation, um, Rockefeller Foundation, Gates Foundation into that because those early funders kind of deemed this fit for them and said, here's the CSOs that have been around since those early days of, you know, Orange Revolution. So we're talking these are organizations that are not brand new. Um, but yeah, so that and gives even, you the same. And even the brand new ones are pretty cool as well. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> these are very generally committed actors in their communities. Yeah, and if you can imagine if someone's in the middle of a war and they find this a valuable resource, this is something that, you know, we're really happy that we can provide. Um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that if I were in a war, I would not have time to have to receive a hundred page critical feedback. <laughs> but I, 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 having done this for a long time, I am actually like pretty humbled by how appreciative yeah. these folks are. Yeah. I was in a position to give actual grants away at some previous grant at some previous organizations. I handed a fifty thousand dollar check to somebody, and that guy was very grateful. Yeah. Yeah. But the the most sincere thank yous that I have received have been from the authors we've reviewed, and also from evaluators. They have really enjoyed the opportunity to help some of these folks out. And, and our longer term dream that Dave and I've been talking about as well is the more reviewer right. skills and capabilities we can get into the hands of these folks in these CSOs, the better as well as funders move to more and more participatory grant making. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I it would be easier to fund in Ukraine if you have Ukrainians. Ukrainian evaluators. proposals for you. Exactly. Exactly. So the more recruitment we can do so that that pool of 400 also begins to include someone from Malawi and someone from Ukraine and someone from Ghana that can be reviewing these proposals as well. So that then when a funder is looking for, for grant reviewers from those different places, they've got people with a lot more context expertise and potentially you know, lived experience with what that organization is. Um, working on. And folks who have been fundraising, will be better at making suggestions for where else to apply Exactly. exactly. as reviewers. I think as funders don't have to raise money, so they don't necessarily know who funds on a topic. But if you're in the, you've actually been doing it. And something that happens a lot of times with our author evaluators, they learn about a new organization that they like and contact and they can go apply jointly for those things. Uh, particularly like the, a lot of the folks in our pool who applied to like Global Fund for Children or those sorts of larger global grant makers, mm -hmm. they seem to like when you apply in coalitions, mm -hmm. small, smaller groups. So uh, very excited about all the potential. Thanks everybody yeah. for coming. Thanks. So if you have any questions for me, I'll stick around and- Yes, you know. yeah, say yeah. Uh, There's probably some more past Yeah, there's some more of these. So David, you can stop recording. You're there in Hollywood. Um, David, any questions for me? The camera's still following you. Oh, yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, I didn't say goodbye. You, you need to wave at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where did you go? Right hand. Did it again? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Technology. Uh, I think we're just going to turn it off. So. Uh, I thank you, everybody. Awesome.